Hi, I'm Donna Magliacano, and I'm the Painter Laureate for 2020 for the City of Murfreesboro. And this year has been a very interesting year to be a Laureate because we started out the year with a lot of excitement about what was going to happen, and then a pandemic happened. So we really had to change course and be malleable about how we could work through our processes and still try to fit the form of what we set out for the year to be. So in keeping with the theme of eye to eye, visions from the heart, I really changed gears a little bit on how I approach my art making. And um, I'm excited to be here at the Rotunda with a show to showcase some of the work I did in honor of this crazy year. So this series of paintings behind me is a series I did to reflect on how I felt the pandemic felt for me um, and dealing with the ever-changing landscapes in front of us. It sort of felt like a, a slideshow. And so I've created this series called Pandemic and it's a quadiptic. It's four paintings in one storyline. The first one, Horizons, um, was the beginning of the year when we were facing 2020 as laureates and saying, what are we going to do with the year? And all this vast sort of possibility in front of us. And then the pandemic came. And so we had to shift our gear and think about how else we might do this. And the second painting is called Media Overload. And in this painting, she's standing in front of a window full of uh, vintage retro television sets. I actually counted, and there are 50 television sets in the window. <laughs> also featured in the window is a small cat, which was my cat Thelma, who I lost this year. So I thought it'd be fun to give her a little cameo here. And she, the the painting talks about how much information came at us from all different directions and it was you know spray your groceries don't spray your groceries don't go outside it's spread by air it's spread by coughing it's you only get it by touching and and so the information changed constantly the third one is called end of an error and this is reflective of the loss of economy through the pandemic, the fact that businesses were not able to sustain through being shut down for long periods. And some of them came back and are coming back, but some didn't make it. And so the figure in this one is standing in front of this warehouse, um, this business that has clearly fallen to pieces. And the fourth painting is called Shelter In. And this is about the fact that we had to spend time in our houses with family and we love our family, but sometimes being with them for that long of time gets challenging. So I really purposely had the figures in this painting not necessarily engaged with each other. They're sort of isolated inside of isolation. And this painting also has a cameo of my other pet that I lost this year, Einstein. He's the little black and white dog you see in the painting making a special cameo also.
another area that I really like to um, express myself is with sculpture. And that's where usually I get to put my sense of humor on things, and I really enjoy creating whimsical, fun sculptures that tell a story. This first sculpture is really fun. I had a lot of fun creating it, and I, and I was thinking about the pandemic as I made it. It's called Stay the Course, and it's a retelling of the story of the tortoise and the hare. So at the top, we have the tortoise who's winning the race. You see him crossing the finish line. And then across the bottom is the rabbit who sort of stepped aside and sprawled out and took a nap and so the tortoise won the race. But it, it really talks about just, you know, stay the course, we'll get through this, we'll all cross the finish line, it's going, there's an end in sight, and so that is what this piece um, reflects for me. The next piece is called COVID Bunny. It's quite clearly a tongue-in-cheek play on the fact that there was a toilet paper shortage for a while. Here I have this rabbit sitting in his chair with his face mask on and, and mounds of toilet paper around him and a big pile of carrots because he's ready to be hunkered in for a long time. He probably bought all the carrots on the shelf at the farmer's market. This last piece is, um, it's called La Pine Dansante, which is French for dancing rabbits. And it's just a really fun, whimsical piece that I created um, using my bunnies that I've done a whole series with. I call them my portly bunnies. And she is in a box dancing. And I did this one really to challenge myself as a sculptor because it was creating the box, the drawer, and all the elements are made of clay except for the curtains on the front of the cabinet and some knobs on the cabinet. This piece kind of was what I call a COVID project piece where I had to slow down and work through it. In this particular portrait, um, I was able to reach out to a friend of mine, Patricia Green, um, and ask if I could use an image that was taken, actually a family photo uh, taken by her husband, Kevin, and it featured her holding her grandson, and the way that she was positioned, it just made me think that she was saying a prayer for him. And this was way back in the early part of the year before the the injustice of the George Floyd instance and the, the Black Lives Matter movement kicked into high gear. This is way back before that occurred. But as the year unfolded and I saw what was happening, I felt really compelled to talk to that issue. And so I painted this portrait. It's called A Grandmother's Prayer. And it features her and, and Zairi in a very thoughtful pose. And I love that his expression has that little bit of a worried look to it. I made a little artistic choice and took out the Nike, Nike, Nike on Zairi's armband on his jumpsuit and replaced it with Black Lives Matters to really put the impact of what I wanted to say with this portrait into place. Hi, my name is Tommy Womack. It's been an honor to be the photographer laureate this year. And uh, what a year it's been, this uh, year of the quarantine. Um, when I think of what has kind of tied it together, if there's a connective thread for me, I was introduced to virtual photography 360 uh, just right before this year. 
And it's been a virtual year, hasn't it? We've seen all of our groups come up with creative ways to get together when you're not allowed to get together. And when I look back over the photographs I took this year, that definitely is one of the attributes they all share. So speaking of virtual, our Rotunda exhibit this year is virtual. And um, we have our, our pictures on display as always. Um, one of the first ones here that I'd like to share, I called it Tiny Sunroom. I kind of borrowed one of the signature statements of, of 360 virtual photography is tiny earth and I think I saw it first in the 70s with a little caricature of the earth and people sticking out in every direction and we would look down and see all the activity going on. You can see the kind of distorted but you see everything and that combination of a little distortion and caricature but omnipresence is how it makes its statement. I'm particularly fond of this room because there's windows everywhere. The rotunda was one of my favorite spots because you walk in this space and there's windows everywhere and light and you can see art everywhere. So that was just a real shoe in for one of my pictures. This is one of my favorite pictures and I think most photographers would admit along with their uh, timing is a little bit of luck. Um, I'm standing on the bridge over Broad. I'm shooting downtown. And when you shoot a 360, you take four shots at 90 degree angles. We're looking down um, south on Broadway, but what you see superimposed is if you were looking east into downtown. And as I was putting these pictures together, the fade between those two produces composite. And it, and it, I just really love it. It's, it was just the right amount of cloudiness to let the two blend together. You could never see that picture standing there because it's two completely different angles. And the way the buildings are rising in the backdrop and the traffic is just at, at dawn with their lights on, it really did produce a certain amount of majesty, which is how I titled it. This spring, I fell in love with the Gateway Park. It's kind of nestled back behind the hospitals. It might not have been my first choice. There's so many great places to go in Murfreesboro, but my colleague Donna had a workshop there, and, and I got to see just what a beautiful park it is, the landscaping, the fountain, it's a nice little building. And it goes on from there. There's you know the wildlife, the ducks, the geese, but when it was quarantine time, it's a great big wide open space. It's a great space to social distance. It's a great big track. It's about a mile if you want to walk your dog, which I love to do, and it has magnificent horizons. Every day, um, again, a photographer's love you know, I've never met a cloud I didn't like. I've never seen two sunsets that look the same. And this is just magnificent. The light against the, the, the clouds at different angles, the uh, luminescence of the, of the grass standing in the forefront. Um, Murfreesboro has a lot of wonderful spots, but it, it's, I have not found a, a nice, wide horizon like this except the Gateway Park and it's just perfect for these kinds of shots of big clouds and big puffy weather moving in and sunrises and sunsets. This is the Gateway too and um, a favorite of mine was the sunsets. I would regularly go for walks every day with my Aussie and uh, you get to know the park and some of the different signatures, the wildlife and I played this little childish game as I'm doing my time lapse, how cool it'd be to be walking along just when the lights come on and capture that moment where the park lights up. I didn't get much better at it. I don't know if it was right at sunset, it wasn't a certain time of day, but I caught a few with luck. And this particular one, I look back and just as all the lights come up, there's this beautiful moon that looks like it's kind of the parent or, or at the very best, a, a Tennessee cousin of all these beautiful lights. So this is at Oakland's mansion. This is a walkway down below the, the mansion itself at, for a cooling springs. You've noticed this recurrent theme in my images and there's Sydney again and a beautiful outdoor scene. Um, when you walk down around to the right, 
the historic sign identifies the cooling springs and I was talking to a friend and just looking in taking in this this beautiful the reflections the the uh, just beginning of the color change in the latter part of the summer and and there Sydney outstanding in the water pose for me looking very contented and very focused and a magnificent combination of colors I couldn't have created this this shot myself but I walked into it that day. When I was first introduced to 360, you took the, the images in singular shots at 90 degree angles to produce the, the uh, panorama. And it had this interesting kind of shape where you would take, take an image and unscroll it, almost like taking a globe and unwrapping it and laying it out flat on a table. And of course, the John Sigenthaler, this is the walking bridge. You couldn't take this anywhere else. Um, looking down on the Cumberland River with the uh, downtown Nashville in the backdrop and the Titan Stadium. And um, the sun is just right. I love clouds because as a photographer, the, the sun is too bright, it ruins your picture. But with clouds, you get just that right combination of light and shade and contrast and you see the glisten on that polished steel it looks like to me who knows what it really is and um, just just a magnificent scene of looking down uh, on the Cumberland River and downtown Nashville. We have a nice small art community here in Murfreesboro and when you get to meet people there's usually connections they, they we all kind of know each other uh, one of the first people I met was Eric Snyder and he oversees the Todd's gallery, the studio at, at MTSU Art Building, and you never know what you're going to see when you go over there. And this exhibit was about quilts. I believe these are all from the United States, but they're just amazing, and the color jumps out at you. My mother was a quilter, so I had a little appreciation. My introduction to photography was through Tennessee landscapes. It's just such a beautiful place. We're here greeting a nice early fall in, in Tennessee. And probably two of my favorite things are clouds and the moon. Um, just like you've never seen two clouds quite the same. The moon, you know, the phases of the moon, when you learn how to shoot it and get the detail of the moon, and if clouds are flirting, the moon might do a little dance for you. Um, a friend of mine, Amy Whitmore, wanted a, 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 a picture to accompany a poem of hers uh, about the moon. And you could never really get a picture like this. I cheated a little bit. Um, I wanted that backdrop of the moon peering through the branches, but to get the focus correct on the branches and the moon would have to be so far apart you could never get this so these are really two separate pictures where you get that incredible close-up of the moon with the toned down lighting so you can see that nice detail of the craters and get the same picture of the branches on a moonlit night where the shadows and the little bit of a luminescence around the branches edges um, and we could see something like that wandering out in a field it just wouldn't be quite that large Hi, I'm Amy Whittemore, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about my Poet Laureate year. Uh, 2020 has been nothing like any of us expected, and it's certainly been an interesting year to be Poet Laureate. Um, it has, the pandemic has impacted my work as a poet, as well as the community work that I had planned to do. In terms of a poet, um, in terms of poetry, it has certainly made me more interested in collaboration and turned some of my energy towards my surroundings. Since you can't go a lot of places, I've been walking around my neighborhood and many of the poems that I'll share with you um, were inspired by those quiet pandemic walks in early spring. In terms of my community engagement, uh, one of the exciting things that came out of 2020 is that I was awarded a Poet Laureate Fellowship from the Academy of American Poets. Uh, this means some of the programming I had planned for in January has now some robust um, financing. Uh, so there is a series of workshops called Write with Pride that I'm creating with Southern Word. 
uh, that will be offered to Middle Tennessee youth, um, LGBT youth. I will also be able to support our local reading series, Poetry in the Borough, with its first ever annual wall calendar, so stay tuned for information about that towards the end of the year. Now I'll read for you one of my poems that are on display here today. Uh, this first one is Pandemic Pastoral, and it is inspired by walks that I would take at Oakland's mansion, uh, which if you don't walk there, I highly recommend. It's a very lovely space with lots of interesting plants and animals to study. Pandemic Pastoral. Afternoon and many spring is different. Minnows shadowed, no longer sun-dazed, flock in small schools, scrimmage over two breadcrumbs I scoot across the stone's lip, left by some other visitor, though I pretend this spot is mine. Beneath their scramble, a crayfish, no, two, scour the bottom for what? I don't know. The water is so clear I can count each pale leg, note the scales climbing their tails, see their claws clip and scuttle through the spring's muck. Minnows surround them like pesky children. The crayfish kick up mud as if to shoo them. Then, in the weeds crinkling the spring's edge, I see a frog, its yellow eye like a blossom. It refuses to move and so I also hold still, but cannot match its patience. Sunlight clamps onto a sunken foil star, pink and glinting. Litter, confetti, what's the difference? It shines as if it belongs. This next poem is about the strawberry moon, and it is in a guzzle form, a loose version of a guzzle. And a guzzle is a poem where there is a repeating word across the stanzas, in this case the word green, and the poet is supposed to reference themselves in the last stanza. Um, I decided to write about each full moon this year as a way to sort of keep me honest as a poet and make sure that I was producing the work that the laureateship required. So this is Strawberry Moon Guzzle. Full as this dill blossom with its many small moons made from even smaller moons. It bursts so greenly I have fallen in love. When we say fall, we mean made gentle and green. My breath shakes this moonburst, sets it dancing. The moon wears a lion's mane as it prepares its fullness. The mane washes it like sun bleaching a green lawn, smearing its gold across suburbia. I have devoted my life to thinking about the wild and the tamed, have named my green heart both. Ripening moon about to burst, ripening moon fruit on an unfathomable vine. Honeysuckle sweats its green perfume across the dusk, invasive and tender at once. I have so many ideas about the moon, ideas as green as they are fleeting. Dill leaves tied with blue string hang in my dining room. The cat's claws, each a green moon learning how sharp it can be. I feel like a boat tugged onto shore. My name escapes me. Sheared of its green mane, the moon and I, we look the same. In this next poem, um, it was inspired by a collaborative writing activity that I participated in with MTSU Write for National Poetry Month. Um, so it was inspired by a prompt and um, also borrows some language and ideas from Elizabeth Bishop's uh, poem, The Shampoo. Battered and shiny. The sky is white as chalk. I am tired of being alone. Trees flare their new green gowns. I'm tired of being dangerous. The empty flower pot hoards last night's rain, and I'm tired of video calls, online grocery orders, anxiety static blurring the days into rough silk, nights into unfolded laundry. Even the edges of my office aloe begin to blur with the pathos. Time is no longer amenable. When will you ask me over? so I may wash your hair, untangle its clutch of stars. So these three poems are from my moon sequence, uh, capturing um, a poem that was inspired by each of the full moons of 2020. Uh, so the first one is Snow Moon, and it is inspired by February. Wolf Moon is January's full moon, and Worm Sap Moon is March's full moon. Uh, so I'll go ahead and read the first one. Snow Moon. 
Despite my doubtful heart, you beckoned snow, or perhaps snow beckoned you, a flourish of moon dust two nights before your arrival. You stepped onto its melting satin and fed the night your sugar, your salt. Below your glow, a possum crossed my path. We gazed at each other and I took the longer way home, circling it, its searching heart, wide as orbit. Wolf Moon. It hung like a blank eye last night over the square, white as its other names. Ice Moon, old moon who chariots a fleck of last year forward in its dark mane. Moon to bead the frost, moon to direct the choir of wintering wolves. But look, no snow, no ice, no wolves. Starlings tussle over sliced bread my neighbor tossed into his backyard, dunking it in potholes like my grandmother dipped donuts in her black coffee, its sugar constellations. The old names fail. January, soft-spoken as a linguist, easy as sorbet. Most wolves are dead, ice thaws and thaws. This moon cradles. Worm sap moon. Full of crows who clench stars in their beaks, full of sunset. Full as a spoon of honey unspilled and golden with hesitancy. Passing by bamboo tangled with starlings, Bradford pears, those weedy trees blooming below lamplight, I too am full of unclipped wings and borrowed light. All right, this next poem of mine I'm gonna read is actually part of a collaborative project that I helped launch this year with the other laureates. The project is called Dream Geographies. And as part of the project, we recruited local artists, poets, and dreamers to contribute their talents. So someone would contribute a description of a dream that I had, and we would share that description with the poet and artist, and the artist and poet would turn it into poems and art. Uh, we were able to feature 11 such collaborations, and you can see some here at the Rotunda, as well as on dreamgeographies.org. Uh, so I'll read you my poem that came from um, a dream by Amy Hoskins. And this is the art that goes with it. How the nightmares are. The shifting mix of locations creates a destabilizing feeling. Hallway, dorm room, family home, work, so many tasks to accomplish, and the blare of bullying voices, the scar of them on my ears like metallic quicksand. So much to do, and yet so much is taken. My clothes, my earrings, my pillow, my locket, what the locket represents. The voices, coated in tar, replace my things with theirs. A stranger's skirt, a blouse printed with snakes, a brooch I'd never wear, a damp handkerchief. A terror eats at the edges of these places, and the edges of these places blur. Hallway, dorm room, family home, work. The rules are strict as glass. Do not waste time, do not fail. Hurry or we'll turn out the lights. Hurry or will. A threat like a ledge at the edge. And the snakes on the stranger's shirt start in on me as well. Their throats like quicksand. But sometimes, like a light left on in a closet, like iris bloom sweetening the air, he shows up. Husband. He doesn't blur into family, home, work, dorm room, hallway. He holds his shape like a purse containing every lost thing, every complete task. The hazel of his eyes, the fullness of his mouth, a window, an open door, a key, a rose garden. We find our way out. <laughs>